I'm joined now by someone who I think has a very unique link to Doctor Who, as not only has he been in it, but he has also written books for the series, which I can't think many can claim. So I would like to introduce writer, supporting artist and monster man, Mickey Lewis. How are you? Hello, nice to speak to you, Alex. I'm fine, thanks. You, you coping okay in these rather odd times? Uh, I'm champing at the bit of it, but um, I'm doing a bit of writing, so concentrating on that while we're away from set, but quite looking forward to going back, to be honest, even though it could be a long way off. Yes, yeah, I know the feeling, yeah. And in terms of Doctor Who, I say you've done all sorts to do with the show, but you've played three different Cybermen. How do the costumes compare? Um, right, the, the latest Cyberman from Ascension onwards and Timeless Children was designed by Ray Holman, and it's the best one yet. When I saw it at the fitting, because it was a big secret, obviously, they didn't put share any pictures with anyone. Just walked into the fitting room at Roe Flock in Cardiff, and I saw the head, and the fanboy in me just went, ah, oh, because it's just a combination of, it's so retro. It's got the invasion style headphones and the, the, the light on the, the top. And I just loved it. It was Revenge of the Cyberman Invasion. It's all those ones I loved from when I was a kid. So, yeah, and I love the little spikes. <laughs> like the little, um, the night flourish that's in the, in the design. But yeah, I loved it. Preferred it to the uh, Nightmare on Preferred it to this little fella. I did like this one though, I must admit. I thought it was kind of sexy. But the, the new one just knocks it, knocks it for six, I think. And then there's the Cybus one as well, which was my least favourite. The big stompy boots, really heavy to move in. Um, yeah, no, that was my least favourite. Although I ended up being more featured in that in the Doctor Falls than in the, the Nightmare one, funnily enough. I'm not sure why, but. There you go, they just, no one else wanted to do it, they stuck me in it. <laughs> and I remember the day I changed from the Cyber, Cyberman to the Nightmare in Silver one, oh, it was mid-morning, I swapped over from one to the other, and as soon as I got the Nightmare one on, so flexible and lightweight, I was just springing around, and it was great. Just felt, you know, light as a charm. Great stuff. But yeah, the, the new one, even better. Love it, just love the design. I think it's frightening again, which I don't think the, um, the Nightmare and Silver one was so much. That was kind of more Iron Man style-y. But this, this one brings the fear back to the face, I think, the, the blank revenge style mask, helmet. So yeah, love it. And it's pretty lightweight to wear, pretty flexible, like the, the Nightmare one, so it just looks better. So something like that, obviously they are iconic monsters and they have a particular way of moving. Are you brought in early to develop their movements or is it all done on the day? Well, we had a lot of movement training for Nightmare and Silver, even though I ended up not doing that one, but I did all the training for it and the, the movements, um, which they wanted us to move in a stealth fashion, a bit like the Terminator, uh, I forgot the name of the... the What's the name of the, um, in Terminator, the, the, uh, Terminator 2, you've got the stealth movement, forgotten the name of the, the character now, but they wanted us to move like that. That was the idea, that was the concept that kind of got dropped along the way because <laughs> it didn't quite work. Um, so that was the basic way of moving and then they just adopted the, the march, the, you know, the, I can't really do it on this video, but um, sort of quite a robotic, soldier-like march with uh, fists clenched. Um, and then when it came to Ascension, they just let us develop it ourselves, really. They, they didn't give us any clear guidelines on how to move, so we kind of just practised a bit on the dining bus in, at Nash Point in South Wales. Went outside on the grass, did a few moves, no one even watching us. So yeah, we kind of worked it out ourselves. It is basically just copying the Nightmare and Silver, but with a few little extra touches. 
Uh, yeah, so the, no one bothered <laughs> guiding us for that one. They just assumed we knew how to do it, which we did, to be fair. And, and in terms of Doctor Who, you've also played you know, iconic monsters, the Daleks, three times. How is it to operate a Dalek? And is that sort of a dream come true as a fan? Well, the first Dalek story I ever did was um, Asylum of the Daleks. And we did a, what they called a Dalek school. And we tried out several different types of Daleks throughout the ages. So I tried the 60s ones, which are barely fit in, because as you know, they were designed for smaller men. And then they put me in the Paradigm Dalek, which was really comfortable, but it's quite heavy. It's fairly easy to move around. And that's the one I caused havoc with on the uh, red carpet. And I also tried the bronze one, obviously, ended up in the bronze one on that one. Um, so, but what sticks in my mind the most about that was we would did the Dalek school for about an hour or two. And then we were moving away from the room where we were doing all the, the training and they had loads of other Daleks in another room. And it was very dim lighting, no one in there. I was the first one in. And you had all these Daleks from throughout the whole you know, 50 years of Doctor Who. You had special weapons Dalek, you had the 60s Daleks, or Paradigm, Ron, everything in there, just absolutely motionless. Dim light was very, very eerie. And I was the only one in the room at that time. I was getting on. <laughs> I quickly tiptoed through them to the far exit. And I, but yeah, that really stuck in my mind. So yeah um as to my favorite dalek i guess it's probably the bronze one because it's comfortable you can fall asleep in it in between takes you can do all sorts in the bronze dalek there's plenty of room you can read a book you can fall asleep you can do whatever you like but yeah that's probably my favorite that's what i've been in the most my least favorite was the special weapons dalek which was absolute hell yeah, <laughs> it's like playing Richard the Third in the Special Weapons. Like Hunchback, oh, there's just no room in it. There's tiny pinholes to see through. Absolute hell, but it looks so iconic and so cool. But yeah, not so great to operate. Throughout Doctor Who, you've not just played monsters. You, you know, your face is very recognisable in a number of episodes. I think I most probably spotted you in. Um, Lie of the Land as the Harbour Master, which was a lovely little scene. It was, yeah. It was a lot longer than the original cut. Um, I actually had some dialogue with another one of my uh, co-workers, and he was asking me if I want tea. I said, yeah, two sugars, mate. <laughs> Obviously cut it down for timing, but which is a shame. But yeah, it was, it was great. Great little part. It's very atmospheric being in this control room of a, a real Harbour Master's. Uh, down on the docks at uh, Cardiff Bay. So he had all the controls. We were told, don't press any controls. So he'd actually be opening <laughs> dock gates and sending signals to ships. And so we had to, there lots of little labels saying, don't touch. <laughs> so yeah, but it, it looked fantastic. And this, this was about two in the morning. And then we had to run out across the, uh, the, the key, the key wall, the harbour wall. To, and they didn't tell us it was, um, I know you said Peter Cushing then. <laughs> Peter Capaldi on, on a this Hulk approaching us. They just said it's a Hulk coming towards you and to act terrified. So I was assuming it was going to be the monks because I knew the monks were in it. So I was going, ah, probably overacting like hell, thinking it was a terrifying monster. And it was Peter Capaldi. <laughs> but yeah, it was a lovely scene. I did enjoy that. Mm. And those sort of lines where you've got lines, do you have to audition for that? Or do they, you know, they've worked with you before and know that you'll be right for it. How does that work? Pretty much that. Yeah, they knew, they knew that you'd done this sort of thing before and that you were confident enough to get away with it and to try it. But on that occasion, there were two of us and they just said, who's got the most acting experience? And I said, well, yeah, I did do a lot of proper acting at one time, which was a few years back. So I know basically how to do it. She said, great, you're doing it then. So I, I was the featured one in the end. And the other guy, bless him, was cut out altogether. So apart from the, on the harbour wall, and he was joined, we were both looking terrified. <clears throat> so yeah, so basically they, they, they have confidence in you if you've done it lots of times before. Mm. Which kind of 
um, led to the Nazi part, I suppose, the Nazi officer in Spyfall. Again, that was cut down drastically, which is a shame. So I had some lovely close-ups of that, which is what all actors love. Um, and I was doing my best evil uh, expression. So when I kicked the door, I actually kicked the door down. And every time I kicked it, the door handle went flying across the room. And you could just hear it go plunk. And obviously they just carried on because they thought that looked good anyway. Uh, and then I, I stand in the middle of the room and the camera was literally as far away as your face is from me now. Three feet away, something like that. Ridiculous, four feet. And I was just sort of gurning at the camera, looking evil. And at the, uh, at the character Noor, who was just sitting there going, yes. And I wasn't allowed to speak. I wasn't given any lines. So I had to do it all into this evil glaring, which they cut out anyway. So I was probably overacting. But <laughs> or timing, dear. Let's say it was timing. <laughs> and then again, when we finally catch up with the, the master, who we didn't know was the master, uh, I had to grab him and frisk him and pull this mind control device out of his pocket. And then point the gun at his head, and there was another lovely close-up of me pointing the gun at him. And I thought I was killing him, you see, because I didn't know it was the master. And I was told that there's going to be a gunshot off screen. So I thought he was dead. Um, and then when I turned up for the Sidewind episode, there was, uh, there was a, a Sasha Dewan double. I said, I said to the AD, what, what, what's going on? I killed him in Spyfall. What's he doing here? And they said, uh, they were trying not to give anything away, but they said, oh, well, uh, it's Time Lord can Oops. So that kind, I just put two and two together and thought, ah, it's the master. I killed the master. Or well, I didn't kill the master. I arrested the master, as it turned out. So <laughs> but yeah. And the funny thing in that scene was when I was frisking him, he had the mind control device in his trench coat pocket. And a one take us fumbling around and it had fallen down inside the lining of his coat. And I was groping and grappling, trying to get it out. And Sasha was doing his lines and he was saying uh, 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 something about um, you've always been uh, sensible people, especially you, because <laughs> I couldn't find the, the device. <laughs> So we all, all, the whole crew were creasing up laughing at this point. Uh, you've all be, always been reasonable people, especially you. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's funny. But I finally found it. And they cut it all. You didn't see the device at all, which was a shame. There, there you go. That's what happens in show business. Something like no, the Nazi officer, you're just given your scenes and you're not explained any sort of you know, motivation and, and wider script points then, eh? They only give you little bits because they don't want to risk anyone leaking the info, obviously. So all I was told about that was that uh, I was a Nazi officer and there was this alien, they just described it as an alien, who was my superior, or who was telling me what to do. Um, obviously, they didn't say it was the master. Um, they didn't say that he was going to survive. As I said, we, I thought I'd shot him in the head. Um, uh, pretty much the, the only gleaned the fact because we were all very puzzled because there were two other Nazi soldiers with me and in one shot I think there were another three and we were all very puzzled why we had an Asian it overlooked uh, you know in charge of the Nazis which what the hell is going on here <laughs> so obviously contradiction in terms and so by the time we got, it was probably a month later when we were doing the, um, the frisking and, and the Eiffel Tower scenes, it was finally explained to us that he had this mind control device, that he was uh, a perception altering device so that we didn't perceive him as, uh, you know, Asian, so, which was kind of a clever gimmick, I thought. But, but the funny thing about that as well, um, when I first met Sasha, uh, I was told to stand in front of him. We both had very similar costumes. We were both obviously officers. He had the long leather trench coat and I had the officer outfit, but I was a bit taller than him. And, and a couple of the other soldiers said that I actually looked more evil than Sasha as a Nazi. So I don't think Sasha liked it. He was nudging me with his stick as I was standing in front of him. He said, can you come back a bit? <laughs> he wanted me behind him and further back, bless him. So, uh, but I think, 
it didn't matter that I looked more evil than him in a way because he wasn't supposed to be a Nazi, you know. I looked more like a Nazi, I think, whereas he was just impersonating a Nazi. So that kind of worked anyway. But yeah, I think uh, he didn't want to be at stage by someone more evil than him. <laughs> so I did look very nasty in the, in the outfit. <laughs> I remember being on, on set with you for some of the your first scene and it was dark and gloomy and you all, you know, yeah. you were particularly sinister. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I remember when I first tried the outfit on, the, the second AD, Chris, Chris Thomas, came in and he went, oh shit, <laughs> and quickly walked out again. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it obviously worked. So, yeah, it's a proud moment being the, the Nazi. It's a horrible part, but... I tried my best with it, and it's just a shame they cut quite a bit of it out. But there you go. That's but in happened. terms, in terms of Doctor Who, an episode that you worked on a probably a bit longer would have been Oxygen, as you're one of the yeah. spacesuit corpses. How long was that? Were you actually on it for then? Uh, gosh, probably did about two weeks work on that. I think, yeah, probably. Um, it was so difficult to walk in those costumes. You probably heard this from the other space corpse actors, but it was it was pretty <laughs> pretty pretty limiting, shall we say, movement wise. And I've got a, a, a ridiculous story behind the scenes for that. When um, we'd already done one scene as the space corpses, and we were retired to this little um, ante room, which was right next to the set where they were filming. And because it was so close to the, the set, we couldn't have any lighting, so it was dark. We had these tall perching stools that we were allowed to sit on, because you couldn't sit down properly. All you could do was perch like that. Um, anyway, the director was filming Peter Capaldi, just around the corner, as I said, and he shouted out, so can we have lots of lovely hush, please, and action. And just as he was saying action, I decided I'd, I was going to perch on this stool in this incredibly bulky costume. So I started lowering onto the stool. I don't think you see me on this camera. I started slowly lowering towards where I thought the stool was. And it wasn't there anymore. Someone had moved it. So what happened was, because you couldn't bend in this costume, I went over flat as a board into a coat hanger rack behind me full of jangly coat hangers. The whole thing went down with me on top of them. It sounded like a jazz band had just been wheeled into the room. And all I could hear while I was lying there like a bird on its back and able to move, just wriggle my arms and legs. I couldn't get up. All I could hear was this ferocious, angry, cut! <laughs> and then the third AD came running around and bless her, she helped me up because I couldn't get up. And I said, oh no. And I felt really bad about that, but couldn't see because it was so dark that someone had actually moved it a bit. And your, your vision was so limited. But anyway, about an hour after that, I was walking down a corridor, still in this ridiculous costume. And who should I see coming towards me but Peter Capaldi? And I was thinking, oh no, he's going to tell me off as well. And what he said was, hello, are you in again tomorrow? In his Scots action, which I can't do. And I said, uh, uh, yeah. He said, oh, splendid. <laughs> Lovely chap. So nice. He just made you feel welcome all the time. So, yeah, that made me feel a little bit better. <laughs> but the rest of the time, I hasten to add, I didn't fall over. It's just the once. <laughs> but that was the one that ruined that take. But great costume, really atmospheric. One of my favourite episodes of that series, I mean. I think it really worked. It was very classic, old-style horror Doctor Who, I thought. Really worked well. And Peter was lovely. I do miss Peter Capaldi, I must say. Would you have had a great deal to do with each of the doctors or were you sort of there for your bits and, and out really? Well, I had a lot to do with Peter in several episodes. He was he made it his you know, he made it his duty to come and speak to you anyway. He was so welcoming to everyone, as you probably know, you put behind the scenes on did you ever work with Peter Capaldi? Or was that after Sadly no, not, no. He was the Everything people have ever said about Pete, how wonderful Peter Cavalli is, it's true. He is the nicest gent on the set. He'll come over, shake everyone's hand, how are you? In fact, the first time I met him, it was into the Dalek, and there are only three of us Daleks on set. And it was his day off, it wasn't required on set. It was in the middle of nowhere, this RAF base, St. Athens. And he, 
I actually come in just to see the Daleks and he came over and he, I was in, in the, in the prop with the, help, the, the lid on and everything and he was going around shaking everyone's hand and he came over to me and started shaking my plunger. <laughs> and he said, hello, what's your name? And I said, uh, Mickey. He said, ah, oh, remember you, Mickey. And, <laughs> and he did. And the next time I saw him, he said, hello, how are you again? And yeah, he was just great. And when I was his chauffeur on the Zygon inversion, I think it was, um, I had to drive him into the, the school, which was a unit base. And he got into the car and Jenna was <laughs> back. And the first thing he said was, hello, can you drive? And I said, oh, I bloody hope so. <laughs> and then another catastrophe. Um, what they didn't tell me was, because I'm, I've never driven a, a really state-of-the-art Land Rover like this one was. And what they didn't say, as soon as you switch the engine off, it automatically locks all the doors. They didn't tell me this vital piece of information. So the AD said, drive in, slam on the brakes, switch the engine off, and then Peter and Jenny will get out. So the action came in through this really narrow gate, and they were more worried about that, I think, than anything else. They'd be scraping this immaculate bodywork. Did that fine, hit the mark perfectly, jammed on the brakes, switched the engine off. There's Peter going like this at the door. <laughs> and Jenna. And I was frantically looking for the release button. No one told me where it was. It's such an you know, alien car to me. Oh my God, cut. <laughs> Next time I've, they told me where it was, but yeah, another hairy moment. But Peter, absolutely don't worry about it. This happens to the best of us. Thanks, Peter. But the, the TV series aside, you've also written two books. Yes, Rags and Combat Rock. Um, yeah, both very, uh, how should we put this, <laughs> divided fan, shall we say. You know, they're very Marmite books, I think. You either love them or you absolutely loathe them. Uh, I remember when, the, when Rags first came out, there were lots of reviews online from from, you know, just from readers, not professional reviews, but they were saying things like, "you," and this is the only book I've ever bought that I've taken back to the shop, and this sort of thing, because they were a little bit out there, shall we say, in terms of the violence and the sex, and which Doctor Who fans weren't used to at the time. They'd never read anything like this before. But I was encouraged to push the envelope, so push it, I did, and that was the result. But um, a lot of people did like it, which you don't tend to remember the good reviews, you just tend to remember the use and the sending it back to the bookshop. So I was really pleased, a couple of months ago, I did a Doctor Who um, convention in Manchester, and one of the guests was Robert Shearman, the, the, um, who wrote Dalek. And he came up to me and he was chatting to me, and he said, oh, yeah, you were, I could tell he wasn't overly interested because he, he thought I was a side man of Dalek, yeah, I've spoken to those before. And then I happened to mention I was doing a writer's panel. So you're doing a writer's panel, how come? I said, oh, I wrote Combat Rock and Rags. And like, what? You wrote Rags? You wrote Combat Rock? I love those books. And he was so enthusiastic and, he, you know, such a lovely bloke. It really cheered me up and made me realise that people did appreciate them. It's just, uh, they were just a little bit Marmite, as I say. But, you know, good fun to write. And... Uh, Made a little bit of money, to, money out of them, so that was all good. Yeah. Well, and I uh, used my two favourite doctors, um, Patrick Troughton and John Pertwee. So, yeah, all good. So was that your choice to write for those doctors, or were you told we want a second doctor book along this sort of lines? No, I think we were just told to write for the past doctors, and you could pick whichever one you wanted. It's so long ago now, this is 2001, 2002. But yeah, I think I chose to do Troughton and, and Pertwee because they were my favourites. So, <laughs> and then people were saying, how can you inflict such horror on Patrick Troughton's team, who were the, the, the most cosiest team ever, probably? I thought, well, quite easily. And I thought Jamie handled it perfectly, you know, because he was supposed to be a warrior, a soldier, whatever he was in the Battle of Culloden, a Jacobean warrior. So... I gave him some warrior type things to do and some people appreciated it and some didn't. So there you go. Can't please everyone all the time, can you, Ali? Well, on the note of 
two other fantastic doctors. I'd like to say, Vicky, thank you very much for your time. And uh, viewers, if you haven't, dig out the books because uh, you'll be in for a treat, I'm sure. Thank you, thank you time, very Vicky. much. Thank you. Pleasure. Cheers.